Good morning and welcome back to our study, God of Restoration, Poetry and Prophecy in Isaiah 40 through 55. So this week we are in lesson three of God of Restoration. It is the servant of the Lord. And we're going to really talk about the meaning of the servant of the Lord because as you'll see, it changes within this passage. And that is part of the key to understanding kind of where this section of Isaiah is going and what it's doing. So we'll really get into that. Um, but first, let's look at what we did last week. So last week, um, we said that there were two questions behind the text that the author is assuming that Israel is asking, right? Is God powerful enough to save us? And does God care enough to save us? Because, you know, this makes sense. Because if if God is powerful enough, and if God loves them, then how did they end up in exile in the first place? And so, you know, it's it's parallel to our understanding of like, well, if God is powerful enough, and if God is loving enough, then why do we have these problems in our world? And so our text really spoke to that. Um, what does the author tell us? What, what stood out to you? God is in control, and he is the creator and sustainer and the man. Okay, God is in control. God is the creator and sustainer. We had a lot of focus on creation, didn't we? So that idea of the goodness of, of God as creator, the greatness of God, God's power in creation, we saw that theme come up over and over. Yeah, what else? God gives us comfort if we follow him. God gives us comfort if we follow him. Okay, so this idea of... Um, that God is trustworthy to come to us and to come to our aid and to comfort us in the end. Like, yes, there are problems. Yes, there is suffering, even though God's powerful enough. Um, you know, he's, he's powerful beyond all the false gods, but we can trust God to comfort us. Yes, great point. What else? Okay, the worthlessness of idols was a little, you know, a section about, and it, it made idols look really ridiculous, really silly, right? And doesn't that come up again in today's passage? We get back to the theme of the worthlessness of idols at multiple points in today's passage, right? That comparison. So we saw four major comparisons of God to other things, right? God to the nations, and God was superior. God to idols, and God was superior. God to the rulers and powers of this world, and God was superior. And finally, even to the heavenly beings, as you might count the stars as the heavenly host. And God is actually the creator and the controller of even the stars. Okay. So those comparisons gave us a sense of the greatness of God. But they all came down to what Lael said, God's love for us to comfort us, to strengthen us so that we can run and not grow weary. Yeah. Anything else from last week that you have been thinking about or want to comment on? Okay, well, let's get into today's passage then. It's a longer passage. We're going to, it's, okay, the, let me give you a little overview of how this passage is structured. This is, helps us. Um, I've, I've mentioned before, and I, I think this is probably relatable, that sometimes if we read these passages and we're just reading, they just flow by, and then we're like, I don't know, it said some stuff. God was the creator. I'm sure it mentioned that. It must have. What did I just read, right? So if we have a little sense of structure, sometimes that helps with some retention. Um, so there are two parallel passages in this larger group. And the first one is in 41, 1 through 21. And it will go through four major points. And so we're going to talk about each of those four major points. Then there is another passage, and it goes through the same four points. So there are two things that are in parallel, 
right? So we're going to spend more time on the first one because we got to get the foundation. And then we'll look how the second one makes some changes. It goes through the same four points, but it develops the theme. So we'll, so we'll look at that. Did I see a comment down? Okay. So um, each of the two parallel passages begins with a poetic version of a courtroom scene. So we're going to read the first one in 41, 1 through 4. Would someone read that, please? In silence before me, you are. Let the nations renew their strength. Let them come forward and speak. Let us meet together at the place of judgment. Who has stirred up one from the east, calling him in righteousness to his service? He hands nations over to him and subdues kings before him. He turns them to dust with his sword, the wind blown chaff with his bow. He pursues them and moves on unscathed by a path his feet have not traveled before. The four. And four. Who has done this and carried it through, calling forth the generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, who sits with the first of them and with the last, I am he. Thank you. Okay, so where are our clues that this is a courtroom scene? A judgment. Judgment. Come out for, to make a judgment. Yep. What else? Come forward and speak. Come forward and speak. Yep. Listen, speak, come for a judgment. So that tells us that we're getting a scene that's like a... Um, there's going to be a demand for a question to be answered. Come and let's answer this question. Okay, so what is the question? What's the question presented for judgment? Who authorized all of this? Okay. Who authorized? Who caused? Who did it? There's a thing that's being done, and the major question is who did it? Okay, what's the first part of the thing that's being done? Verse 2. Raised up the righteous man from the east. Okay. Raised up one from the east. Um, I know yours puts righteousness in that first line. Uh, most translations put it in the second. It's in between, so it could go either way. Um, raised up one from the east. All right. Who is the one from the east? Like, who are we talking about? What's that about? Good question, right? <laughs> There's, debate There's debate about that. There's more than one possible answer. Carrie, do you want to tell us what you know about the debate or what some possibilities might be? Okay, Cyrus is a big possibility. In yeah. fact, that is the answer that modern scholarship gives. Abraham, now that's a little less, um, I think, intuitive to us. So let's talk about both of those. Now, I'll tell you that when I first read this, I was like, do they mean Babylon? Babylon came from the east and conquered um, Judah, right? And brought them into exile in the east. So maybe they're talking about Babylon. After studying the whole passage, it doesn't quite fit because we're not really talking about Judah going into exile in the first place, but we're talking about what happens that allows them to be done with the exile. So my first instinct, Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, someone like that, doesn't quite fit, and yet there are some hallmarks of that too. Modern scholarship says Cyrus. Cyrus was king of Persia, who at 540 BC was like, sweeping through, conquering nations, and would eventually conquer Babylon. And because, okay, so Judah is in exile. They are under the control of Babylon. Cyrus comes in and conquers Babylon. So like, basically, he's conquered the overlords of Judah, right? And then he sends them back to Jerusalem. So we know that from history that Cyrus is going to send them back to Jerusalem, and that will be kind of the end of their exile. Now, is they're, they're not done with being an occupied nation or an oppressed nation or being under the thumb of other nations, right? We, 
uh, we we've, we've looked at that that time of Daniel and we see like they're pretty much continuously under somebody's control all the way through Jesus time and beyond but that is the end of the out of Jerusalem into Babylon exile period right so they're taken back so Cyrus is the obvious answer here and we see that Cyrus does things like look um it's he delivers up nations before him those pronouns are confusing aren't they in verse two mm -hmm. this would be God the one who does the thing you know the question is putting it to you who does the thing the, who, what's the answer going to be God right we haven't gotten to the answer that's at the end of verse four but the answer is going to be God right God delivers up nations before him the one from the east Cyrus God yes God is enabling his conquering like swath right he's he's chewing up the nations right he makes them like dust with his sword he's their wind driven chaff with his bow right those are just two parallel weapons and the idea is that he's the conquering horde right so that's what the one from the east does he's a conquering machine but the focus is on who empowers him who who has caused this thing to happen and that's the question presented for judgment that God presents for judgment and then God gives the answer at the end of verse 4 what does God say I the Lord I Yahweh I am the first and the last I am he I do it God is the one who raises up one from the east. So whatever is happening with this conquering machine that's moving across their territory, God is telling them, I'm causing this to happen. Okay. Given that, oh, go ahead, Chris. Well, it also, in some places in here in verses two and three, it prefigures the Magi and calls from the east um, subdues kings and he pursues them and moves on unscathed by a path of the street not traveled before. Okay, so you're on to something. Um, Chris said that this this sounds like the Magi. It may be a, a pre-echo of what happens with the Magi. Um, Let's think about it also being an echo of what happened with Abraham. Where did Abraham come from before God called him? It was Ur. <laughs> well, Ur, it turns out, is the east. It is what, like, close to where Babylon would be later. So Abraham was called from the east. Now, very often in the passages that we read most about Abraham, Abraham is presented as kind of a nomad rather than a conqueror. But if we go back and read Genesis 13, Abraham goes up against multiple kings and defeats them. And so Abraham is also a conqueror. And ancient Jewish commentary assumed this was talking about Abraham. Well, how could it be both Abraham and Cyrus? Well, the thing about it that's, you know, um, they both come from the east. They both come into a land that's not their own. They will both eventually conquer the land. You know, Abraham, it's like he does a little conquering and then they go into Egypt and then they come back and truly conquer the land as God's people after the exodus. Right. So it's an extended thing. But both are brought by God to accomplish God's purposes. So when we see that in the Magi as well, God does a thing, you know, God, um, God accomplishes something by means of a person he calls. And one of the keys to understanding this this way is in the second line of verse two. Okay, who has aroused one from the east whom he calls in righteousness to his feet. Now you may have a different translation because that line is hard to translate. One that I read you the NASB, the NIV says calling him in righteousness to his service. And then if you're looking at an NIV, there should be a footnote 
but says it could also be translated whom victory meets at every step. Well, that's weird. Those are very different, right? How is victory at every step an alternate translation to righteousness to his service? Okay, so take it in two parts. The last part is the easier part. Um, literally, that he calls in righteousness to his foot. So if we take that idiom idiomatically, like if it's an idiom to his, then it could mean um, someone like getting to their feet, like ready to act, like let's, everybody on their feet. You could say that metaphorically, right? And we would know what you meant. Um, it could be like at the foot of the throne, right? Someone to their service at the foot of the throne, right? Or it could be every step, step by step. Um, one foot at a time. Um, and that's how we get these different translations to chew their feet. But how can victory be an alternative translation to righteousness? That's strange, isn't it? The key is in our understanding of our Hebrew word for righteousness. It's the regular word for righteousness, but let's think about how it's being used. It does mean right action, but sometimes we might think about it as like displaying good morals, mm -hmm. you know, like maybe holiness, like doing, like not doing wrong things. Don't cheat or steal. Don't drink and smoke or, you know, whatever you might put under moral, moral rightness. It's not really talking about that. It's talking about the right action of God to accomplish God's purposes. And the right purpose of God for Israel here is deliverance. That's what God is doing with God's righteousness is delivering his people. And so when you put it with the rest of the paragraph, the right action God is doing to deliver God's people is the victory of this, uh, this one from the east that is coming through. And so it's that understanding of righteousness as God's right action for um, accomplishing God's plan. God Go ahead. I just said the God given. The God given purpose, right? right? Which here is victory. Okay, so that is how we get righteousness. We understand that weird translation, but it also tells us what's going on with it being Abraham or Cyrus or even Nebuchadnezzar or much later, maybe the Magi. God does these things in God's wisdom to accomplish what God needs to do for redemption, for deliverance, for victory. And that's kind of built in to this passage. Comments. You can look at it more generically. More generically. Say more about that. In terms of history. Okay. Because it could maybe be all these people, but maybe that's not important at all. It can be applied to any conquering person or anything that's going on in, or movement in the world through all time. Any movement that God wants to do for what God wants to accomplish. Yeah, and that's kind of how these passages work. This this section 40 to 55 is it moves from more general into the more specific. So later we're going to actually see Cyrus's name in the text. But early on, it can be a kind of several layers of person or event, right? We're going to see that in other ways in this passage as well. Those layers um, where there's an obvious um, application to the time it's written, and then there's more, right? More layers laid on top of it. Okay, let's keep going. As what else? As the preacher said, there's nothing new under the sun. <laughs> <laughs> nothing new under the sun. And um, this is sort of like the way God works is continuing to, I mean, there's always... There's multiple plans of God, but they always lead to the great one plan of God to redeem people into God's presence, into life with God. That's always the end goal of all the many plans of God, if that makes sense. 
Okay, so the one from the east, probably Cyrus most literally, but we remember that there are these layers on top of it, okay? And um, it ends this courtroom section by God proclaiming the answer. Come out for judgment, I'm the one who does it. All right, let's read um, 5 through 16, please. This is going to be points two and three. I said there were four points in each of our parallel passages. So the first point is the courtroom scene, and now we'll do points two and three. What are we reading? Five through 16. The aisles saw it and feared. The ends of the earth were afraid, drew near and came. They helped everyone his neighbor, and everyone said to his brother, be of good courage. So the carpenter encouraged the goldsmith, and he that smoothed with the hammer him that smote the anvil, saying, It is ready for the soldering, and he fastened it with nails, that it should not be moved. But thou, Israel, art my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend, thou whom I have taken from the ends of the earth, and called thee from the chief men thereof, and said unto thee, Thou art my servant, I have chosen thee, and not cast thee away. Fear, fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help you. Yea, I will uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness. Behold, all they that were incensed against thee shall be ashamed and confounded. They shall be as nothing, and they that strive with thee shall perish. Thou shalt seek them, and shall not find them, even them that contended with thee. They that war against thee shall be as nothing, and as a thing of naught. For I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee. Fear not, thou worm Jacob, and ye men of Israel. I will help thee, saith the Lord, and thy, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Behold, I will make thee a new sharp threshing instrument having teeth. Thou shalt thresh the mountains and beat them small, and thou shalt make the hills as shaft. A shaft. Thou shalt fan them, and the wind shall carry them away, and the whirlwind shall scatter them. And thou shalt rejoice in the Lord, and shalt glory in the Holy One of Israel. Thank you. Okay. So, um, all right, let's go back up to uh, verse 5. You, the islands have seen, the coastlands have seen, and are what? How, what are the nations feeling? Fear. Fear. They are afraid, okay? And what do they do when they're afraid? They come together. They come together, and what? You said something, Lynn. Help each other. Help each other do something. They're doing something specific. They have a craft. They're building idols. They're building idols. Yeah, because look at, um, let's see, uh, craftsman in verse 7. The craftsman encourages the smelter, right? The last time we used the word craftsman was back in verse 7 when the craftsman was making idols, right? How else can we tell we're talking about idols? We've got the goldsmith, and they're hammering things smooth. They're hammering things smooth. What else? Ready for soldering, fashioned with nails. It's not going to be moved. Right. So it will not will not totter. Right. Uh, yours didn't have the word totter. I noticed. Yeah. But the if you have um, NIV or NASB, you're going to see that same phrase. So it won't totter. Mm -hmm. Right. It's that same idea as your poor little idol won't fall over that we saw in the like idols are ridiculous passage mm -hmm. last week. Right. Um, so what we're seeing here is that they are afraid and their reaction to being afraid is to c encourage each other to make nice idols. Like, that's all they've got. They just don't have a lot of recourse. All they can do is encourage each other. That's really good. That's that the smithing is really nice. Keep going. That's going to be good. But not so with God's people. Look at verse eight. What is what do God's people have instead? They've chosen. He's chosen someone. They are the chosen, right? The nations can only encourage each other to make better idols. But Israel has something totally different. Verse 8, 
you are my servant. You mentioned servant is an important title um, in Isaiah. It actually occurs 19 times in just this section that we're studying. So, you know, we know it's pretty important. God says in verse 9, I did what? I've chosen you. They were worried. They were worried God had rejected them, right? But God says, no, I have not rejected you. In fact, I have chosen you. So the servant is Jacob, is Israel, is the, the Jewish people, right? The people of God here. They are the servant here. And God says three times, verse 10, um, 13, and 14, what gets repeated? Fear not. Fear not. Do not fear, um, your translation will say. This idea of do not fear, you don't need to be afraid. The nations, they're afraid. But you don't need to be afraid. And notice that it's God's righteousness that will produce this outcome. Verse 10, with my righteous right hand or my right hand of righteousness. The work of God will, will do this. And verse 11 and 12, you'll be vindicated against your enemies, right? All those who are angry at you, uh, angry at you will be ashamed. Um, you're going to get it done and they're going to be as nothing or non-existent, my translation said. You are said as not. Yeah? When he talks, calls Jacob, is he talking about both the north and the south, Israel, or just south? Okay. It, it gets confusing, doesn't it? Um, when he says Jacob, who is he talking to? So Jacob is patriarch. So Jacob isn't, isn't equivalent to Judah, right? Jacob is Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. So this is just a poetic way of using synonyms. Remember how we so many times have couplets where we have two things in a row that say the same thing? Jacob and Israel are the same person, and they are that patriarch. And he's using, even he's talking to just the people in the south because the people from the north, remember they they've really intermixed. They become what's later Samaria. There's nobody left to talk to exactly. So this is the southern half, but they become at this point. They're what is left. They are the remnant is how the earlier part of Isaiah will talk about it, of the people of God. So when he says Israel, he's addressing just everyone who's left, which is the Judahites or Jews who are exiled in Babylon. Confusing a little bit, right? Um, did I answer the question though? Okay. All right. So talking to Jacob, Israel, basically the people of God are the servant here. Um, and we see what it means. These are the things that it means. It means being chosen. It means God being with you. It means God carrying out God's plan through you. Okay. In verse 14, God says, God will help them because your redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. And the Holy One of Israel is a particularly distinctive title to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah likes to use Holy One, Holy One of Israel as a title for God. Notice that God's action is defined as redemption. What does that mean to us? Redemption. Redemption. Why is it why is he calling it redemption? What does that what does redemption mean? Bringing him back to bringing him back with a price. Buy, with a price. Buying them back, getting somehow rescuing them out of slavery, darkness, something, buying them back out of it. It says he's calling what he's going to do for the Jews, redemption, right? We're used to the word redemption. That is a word that is used for our salvation as well. So we already begin to see how what's here is going to parallel our salvation. <laughs> We're looking for that. Okay, so that will parallel um, what God is going to do later in God's plan through Jesus. So we're watching for that. Here's an interesting little bit. Verse 14, do not fear you what, Jacob? Worm. Worm. Well, isn't that kind of mean? 
I would not want to be called a worm. You wouldn't want to be called a worm. Okay. I think that can come off, especially to like a modern sensibility as like contempt, but contempt doesn't fit with the rest of this passage, does it? This is a very loving passage, isn't it? Yeah. Why does he call them worm? What, do they, what does God mean by worm there? Does that refer to death? Death, I, I don't think so, but I, I might think about it and there might be something to that. Okay, a created being that's big and significant or feeble, small, feeble, small yeah. lowly. Yeah. So something small and insignificant. So it may be that they are small and insignificant compared to the powers they're up against, or maybe kind of in the eyes of all those nations. They're just considered just the tiniest thing, just a worm, just the smallest thing. But think about what a worm does. What does a worm like? Digs in the dirt. Digs in the dirt. Like, or aerates the soil. Basically, like, consumes the soil and leaves soil behind him, right? That's what a worm does. Look at the next bit. They're a tiny little insignificant worm, but verse 15. I will make you a new sharp threshing, threshing sledge with double edges. It's moving through the soil, but in power, yeah. right? It's doing the thing a worm does, but doing it in a way that is like a victorious, uh, sort of intimidating, powerful way. So I think, I think that's a poetic setup is what that is. You worm Jacob, yes. You are considered this tiny little insignificant thing, but I'll, it just eats soil, but I will make you eat soil in a way that is a victorious way. Mountains. Powerful, mountains, yes. All, the mountains are pulverized, my translation yeah. says, pulverized, or the hills just become like chaff and the wind carries them away. There's that same motif of the grass being blown away again, mm -hmm. so that the nations, right? Israel is going to become powerful enough that the nations are just blown away like the withered grass. Go ahead, Lee. There's that hymn that the line is like, for such a worm as I. Uh-huh. Yeah, <laughs> they fall off, so they, like in later versions of the song, because they change it to such a one as I. Yes, yes. We don't like being called worms, do we? Now, this is what we have to remember when we get called a worm, that the worm in the power of God becomes the double-edged threshing sledge, right? It becomes the instrument, the powerful instrument of God, right? Pulverizing the mountains. So that is a really, um, I just found that to be a very entertaining little poetic bit there. The contrast here is between the nations who are afraid and only have idol making to turn to and Israel who has God on their side. They don't have to fear they're being made into uh, a formidable power. All right, let's read the last bit, um, 17 through 20. Would someone pick up that? The poor and needy search for water, but there is none. Their tongues are parched with thirst, but I, the Lord, will answer them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. I will make rivers flow on barren heights and springs within the valleys. I will turn the desert into pools of water and the parched ground into springs. I will put in the desert the cedar and the acacia, the myrtle and the olive. I will set pines in the wastelands, the fir and cypress together so that people may see and know, may consider and understand that the hand of the Lord has done this, that the Holy One of Israel has created it. Thank you. There's that Holy One of Israel yeah. again, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So it seems like there's a bit of a disconnect here, right? They're, they're pulverizing mountains, and then suddenly they're poor and needy. They are parched, right? They're seeking water, but there is none. So I think what's going on as we go from one verse to the next is I'm going to make you pulverize the mountains, but I know right now you're just, you're, you're suffering still right now, needy. right now you're still needy right now. You're still like someone searching for water in a desert and you don't have it yet. And so this is like a, 
their whole so was Israel literally thirsty? Maybe, but is this talking about them literally being thirsty, not having enough to drink? No. Desperate. They're desperate, desperate, right? It's a poetic description of their desperation. And so in answer, we get a poetic description of what God does for their thirst, meaning for their desperation. What does God do? Open the rivers. Right? Rivers are opened. What else? Springs. Valleys. Springs and the valleys. Springs. Yeah, what else? Water. Water everywhere. Yeah, a beautiful and in the desert, you know, that's not like flooding bad. That's like life giving water good. What else? Trees. Trees. Shade. Yeah, what else? All these plants. Every the cedar, the, the wilderness is truly transformed here right is if israel's problems are some of israel's desperation is symbolized by being parched in the desert then god will have them luxuriating in a garden of an oasis of water and greenery it's like a garden of eden coming back. <laughs> oh exactly it's like a garden of eden coming back right What's a garden that God put on earth that was full of goodness and highlighted trees? Exactly. The garden in Eden, the place of unity with God and no trouble before sin. And so this is garden imagery. This is restoration. This is recreation. It's a vision of the original goodness of creation being recreated by God. God will again make the paradise that God intended in the world and what will be the effect on everyone verse 20 they'll know that god has created they will see it and recognize god right the hand of the lord the hand of yahweh has done this the holy one of israel has created this it will witness what god can do for god's people yeah, it's a picture of redemption in the form of garden imagery Okay, so those are the first sections, the four sections of that first passage, right? One through four, the courtroom scene, who brought the deliverer? God did. Verse uh, five through seven, the nations are afraid and can only turn to idol making. Eight through 16, but Israel is God's servant and will have God's help. So there's no need to fear. And then 17 through 20, they, you may be like one dying of thirst now, but God is going to create a lush paradise a recreation of the garden and everyone will see god's power and righteousness and that's verses seven 17 through 20 was the last section so that all, all is like one through 20 kind of give us that first parallel passage comments or questions on that each section although if you divide them up a little bit differently starts with the week and goes to what god will do okay starts with she says each section and you and she mentions that you can divide them slightly differently different commentaries do divide them slightly differently right like so people can um see that there's four points but where you draw the divisions mm -hmm. is variable yeah exactly but she uh, mary points out that it starts with the week and proceeds to what god will do well, that's the situation of salvation, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Great point. Okay, let's look. Um, so I was very stressed when I was writing this lesson because I kept feeling like I'm spending so much time on the first few verses. I'm not going to have time for all the last verses. But what, it's, that's okay because we're really going to look at where they change, where they differ, right? So take a look at 21 through 29. This is our next courtroom scene, our next call for judgment. Verse 21, um, the Lord says, the king of Jacob says. So the king of Jacob is a, a way of describing God, right? There is no king of Israel exactly at this point, but that, the true king has always been God, right? When Israel wanted a king, God says, but I was your king. Fine, take a king. Um, but here the king of jacob means god so god is saying bring forth your arguments and then it's let them bring forth let them declare what's going to take place who's them can you tell 
the yeah. idols. Yeah. Mine says, tell us you idols. What is going to happen? Okay. So that is a translator's um, helper um, kind of insertion, and it is helpful, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's not, it's not literally in there, and that's okay, but it really, that's it. It's them, the idols. And he's challenging, God is challenging the idols to do what? Tell us what is going to happen. Right, to prophesy, to tell us what is going to happen. So that meaning of prophecy that's to tell the end from the beginning, to tell the future, kind of, is we can think of it. God's saying, can you do that? Can you tell what's going to happen? And so that is the challenge presented. There's a repeated call for the nations to do that. Verse 23, that we might know that you are God's. But of course they can't. And so in verse 24, they are of no account. I like what verse 23 says here. Do something. Yeah. Good <laughs> right. Uh-huh. Mine says, indeed, do good or evil. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like do something. I think that's me. Yeah. Do something. Have an action. Tell us what's going to happen. Make something happen. But they cannot. Only Yahweh can. Absolutely. So um, verse 25, we return to kind of the same thing that was called out in the first section. I have aroused one from the east. This time it's I have aroused one from the north, from the rising of the sun. Where's the rising of the sun? East. East. So we get two directions this side, from the north, from the east. This is the same person. Mm -hmm. It's more like um, how you count Babylon, uh, the um, Persians coming, like they... They, they're, they are in the east, but they come around from the north. And so this is the same person being talked about. So we're back to Cyrus slash Abraham slash, you know, the other applications that we could make of it, right? Well, Assyria, so remember Assyria's conquering horde came like 150 years before. So you could actually make a similar point because that, you know, God says, I used Assyria to um, deal with the sin of Israel the same way that God says, I used Babylon to deal with the sin of Judah when we're talking about north and south, right? Um, But that's way in the past at this point, right? So we're we're talking about what's going to happen next, right? His focus is on... Can you tell the future? Because I have. You know why I can tell the future? Because I can create the future. I have aroused this one from the east. And so God is doing a thing. It's active. Okay, verse 26, we get a contrast, right? Here's here's the the um, proclamation. Who is declared from this from the beginning? So that we might look and say he is right. None of the idols, but... Um, God can do so, right? Formally, I said, this is God speaking, verse 27, to Zion, behold, here they are, and to Jerusalem, I will give a message of good news. All right, the idols are worthless, but God can do it. He, God returns to this little theme of I can tell the end from the beginning in the next little section. All right, so this passage demanded a judgment of who is the true God, just like the earlier one, and answered it that God did, although there was no, like, one-liner that proclaimed it like there was in the first section, right? Not exactly. So let's look at um, 42. We're going to, so look at the next section now. Remember, this is parallel to the one that says, Jacob is my servant, Israel is my servant, meaning the Jews that are left, Israel. Okay, 42, 1 through 7. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry out or raise his voice nor make his voice heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break and a dimly burning wick he will not extinguish. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not be disheartened or crushed until he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands will wait expectantly 
for his law. Thus says God the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and its offspring, who gives breath to the people upon it and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will also hold you by the hand and watch over you. I will appoint you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the nations, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoner from the dungeon and those who dwell in darkness from the prison. Okay, so this is the servant section and it has changed a little bit, hasn't it? It doesn't feel like the servant is exactly the same role, okay? Israel was the servant, the Jews, the, the nation, the people that were left in the parallel passage. But what's the problem with Israel filling the role of servant as it's described in this passage? What is there anything that makes you feel like maybe Israel can't actually be the servant that's just we know it should be Israel, right? Mm -hmm. The last the their parallel there's these parallels are like definitely uh intentional because they're so close. And the last one told us the servant was Israel, so we should <laughs> the servant should be Israel in this one. But they haven't been faithful. But they haven't been and faithful. They haven't they have faltered, right? This is a really tall order for us to believe that Israel could fulfill it. I keep thinking of Jesus when I read that. You keep thinking of Jesus. Why do you think of Jesus when you read that? Yeah, caring for the weakest. Right, so this sounds like the gentleness of Jesus. It also sounds kingly, right? Who can bring justice? <clears throat> oh, that's a job for a king. Only a king can bring justice, verse 1, or establish justice in the earth, the whole earth, verse 4. Only a king can issue a law that the coastlands, the nations are, this non-Jewish nations are waiting for. Is really Israel really up to the task? And then look, this person is also, uh, verse six, a covenant. You are a covenant to the people. An earthly king can make a covenant, but this servant is going to be a covenant. So there's just more here than we think Israel is really up to the job. Go ahead, Chris. And when John's followers came to Jesus and said, well, are you the one? Jesus said what? On the first seven. Okay. So, all right. So um, the... Tell, tell John what you've seen. Right. The eyes of the blind that have been kept and have been freed. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The New Testament specifically draws on these passages to describe Jesus. Let me read to you Matthew 12, 17 through 21. This happens when Jesus is going about healing and he's doing so quietly and sometimes secretly. And Matthew says, this was to, verse 17, this was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. Here is my servant whom I have chosen, the one I love in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will proclaim justice to the nations. He will not quarrel or cry out. No one will hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break. A smoldering wick he will not stuff out till he has brought justice through victory. And in his name, the nations will put their hope. Matthew quotes this passage and says, Jesus fulfilled it. This also talks about um, being a light to the nations. Who was a light to the nations? Jesus, he's the light of the world. He, John calls him the light has come into the world. Jesus says, and John says, I am the light of the world. Jesus talks about in, in Luke 4, he says, he gives his mission statement. I'm here to open the prisons and 
open the eyes of the blind and heal the deaf. Now that is a quote from Isaiah 61, but it's one that echoes this passage so closely, same ideas, right? So what we see is that the redemption that God is promising, yes, God is promising Israel will be God's servant. It doesn't erase that or cross it out or anything, but God is promising more than that. Yes, to bring the Jews back to Jerusalem, but that's not all God is doing. God will be doing much more. There's more to come. There will be a new servant who is somehow Israel and yet like the, the nation and also an individual who has somehow Israel and also more than Israel who can bring justice, who can be a king. And so this is already deepening what we understand about this role of the servant and pointing us forward to the greater plan of God. God's righteousness cannot end in just bringing the Jews back to Jerusalem. God has so much more in God's righteousness. It has to have the rest of the plan of God in Jesus Christ to be the full God's righteousness. And that's why we conclude in praise. Look at verse eight. Um, I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. Oh, I'm starting in six. Sorry. I am the Lord. That is my name. I will not, which doesn't make sense unless you read it Yahweh, which it does say, you know, I am Yahweh. That is my name. I will not give my glory to another, nor my praise to graven images. Behold, the former things have come to pass. Now I declare new things. Before they spring forth, I proclaim them to you, right? Idols can't do it, but God can. Sing to the Lord a new song, right? God has, is going to do a new thing, and we're going to praise him with a new song. Sing his praise from the ends of the earth, you who go down to the sea and all that is in it. You islands, so we're spreading out. It's not just the Jews who are going to see God's wonderful new thing, right? This is going to, out to other nations as well. Um, you islands and those who dwell on them. Let the wilderness and its cities lift up their voices. The settlements where Kedar inhabits and the inhabitants of Selah sing aloud. Let them shout for joy from the tops of the mountains. Let them give glory to the Lord, to Yahweh, and declare his praise in the coastlands. Yahweh will go forth like a warrior. He will arouse his zeal like a man of war. He will utter a shout. Yes, he will raise a war cry. This is like a king, right? This is what a king does when he leads the people into war. He will prevail against his enemies. And so somehow now the servant is the servant, and it's also God himself right? The Lord will go forth like a warrior, not just the, the servant isn't just a servant. The servant is also Server. God, right? Oh yeah. Def, always, always the, 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 the humility and the service that God offers are on display. Now, war, being a warrior is a service, but it's kind of a, um, a bold service too, right? Yeah. So we have this, um, conclusion here in praise for the new thing and we see the role of servant god is putting a lot more meaning into this role of servant that idea will continue as we come into the next passages right this idea of the servant i said there's 19 mentions right so it's going to be mentioned a bunch more time it's going to have this multiple meaning sort of situation will continue so that we have the servant being more than Israel, also God himself, the king, the, um, the one who is gentle. There's a message for Judah in exile here, but more, more we also have a message for the generations, don't we? Um, and the nations and, you know, they're invited to come. Who is God? Who has done a marvelous thing? Who has promised victory? Who can deliver it? God says, I will deliver it, and I'm going to deliver much more than just your situation. Gonna, Comments, questions? Well, yeah. He says right here, he will prevail against his enemies. Not all kings prevail against their enemies. But True, but God promises victory and is going to deliver it. Yeah, yeah. Prevail against his enemies. What else?
All right, thank you. There's, you know, we have this, we're gonna finish this with, because of the servant, the servant is both Israel and more than Israel, who's also somehow God, who is also a light to the nations. This is a victorious warrior who is also so gentle as to not break an already bent reed. So it's the same message as the God of power, who as is gentle as the shepherd gathering up the little lamb, right? We're getting an echo of that same idea. We know that God has brought and is bringing and will bring that victory in Jesus Christ. Jesus will be the ultimate fulfillment of everything as God is doing. And these passages begin to layer their meanings on top of each other in order to point to it. God's righteousness will be the complete deliverance according to God's good plan. And it's only just getting started. So thank you. We are going to be um, in Isaiah, the rest of Isaiah 42. I don't know that I have the, let me see if I have the passage here. Next week is service day. So we'll be off next week. And then we have Isaiah 42, 14 through 43, 21 for the following Same lesson. Again, 42. 42, 14 through 4321 <clears throat> and you can always find the full schedule on yanamunger.com slash isaiah thank you thank you